Today is going to be very powerful. It's going to be very, very powerful. Um, so we're going to go to Luke 19. You guys can just stand up and read this. Luke 19, verse 1. Luke 19, verse 1. I'm going to read this. Got a lot of family in the house. Yes. Yes. So blessed to have you guys. So blessed to have those of you who are watching online. Can you guys give it up for our YouTube live audience? Yeah. All right, so Luke 19, it says, Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. (laughs) And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short of stature. So he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him for a head, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste, which means he did it quickly. <laughs> I don't know if people talk like that anymore. Make haste. Make haste. No one says that. Okay. Uh, So he made haste and he came down and received Jesus joyfully. Now, when the other people saw it, (laughs) they complained, saying, oh, he's gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, 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 I give half my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anybody by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he is also a son of of Abraham. The name of the message today, part two of a series we're calling We Are Family, the name of the message today is called Love Language. Love Language. I just want to pray. Lord, I just thank you. I thank you right now for your presence in this place. Father, I thank you for your presence for those who are watching online in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I thank you that your people need an encounter with you. And Lord, you are not going to disappoint us in that area, Father. You said if you draw close to me, I will draw closer to you. I want you to raise your hands right now. I don't care about your pride. I don't care if you're embarrassed. I don't care if you think people are looking at you. Listen, if you need a breakthrough, God is here to meet your needs. I promise you. He is ready to move forth in your life. Can you just extend your hands out to him? Even at home, extend your hands out to him right now. Extend your hands out. He's not mad at you. He is not disappointed in you. He loves you. He has called you. He has chosen you. He he doesn't want you to look at all your mistakes and all your failures and all your issues to disqualify yourself. He says you are qualified because you are mine. You are qualified because you are his. You are a son and daughter of Jesus. He loves you. It doesn't matter how much you know about the Bible. It doesn't, know, it doesn't matter how much you know about God. It doesn't matter how often you go to church or watch church online. It doesn't matter. He loves you. You are qualified because you are his, and he created you in his image and in his likeness. And the desires that you have, God is saying, hold on, hold on to those desires. Do not lose faith. Do not give up. Do not say, oh, that's just not going to happen. I've been waiting too long. God is saying, with me, all things are possible. Don't lose your faith. Don't give up. Keep holding on. Keep believing. Keep confessing. Keep praising me. Even in the midst of your valley, even in the midst of darkness, keep, keep just keep praising him. He is right here, and he's going to show you. Father, bless this word. Anoint my mouth. In Jesus' mighty name. If you're in agreement, everybody say amen. Thank you, brother. Give it up for my boy, Evan. He just got engaged. Yes. Just got engaged. Yeah. Excited for him. Excited for him. You know, uh, today I'm really blessed. This is my first message, and I'm going to... Uh, speak without my dad being here. And, uh, you know, my dad was my amen section. Um, my sister Rose and my mom are sitting where he usually sits. And so my dad would say, amen, well. I mean, he would do some, like, some old school Baptist stuff. I mean, <laughs> he was making up stuff. I was like, what? okay, okay. 
But he was just, you know, he was just very supportive in any way he can. So today, I need you to say amen when you are feeling something, okay? When something agrees with your spirit, when something hits you, you better let me know. Can you let me know? Let me know. Because what's happening is, is that you're drawing on the anointing that God has placed on me. I'm telling you, you're drawing out. All of a sudden, I just be start, start saying all type of stuff that God is showing me because we're all in agreement together. Amen? So you can amen me out today. Don't hold back. This is not a quiet church. This is not a quiet church. I'm so excited because the Lord said that, you know, my brother Joe said something today in prayer. He said that the harvest is coming, and you were so prophetic when you said that, because there was something significant when we changed our name last week. We had been Purpose Place Church, and the Holy Spirit showed us to be Purpose Place LA. Now, to all the religious minds, people are like, well, why'd you take out church? You're not a church? No, 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 no. We are a church, because God says with two more are gathered, that's where I'm, that's where I'm at. We are a church, but the Holy Spirit is saying this is the season and in these times that he's calling churches to be churches without walls, meaning that we can't just be trying to get everybody in this building. You know what I'm saying? Like there's billions of people on earth, like not everyone's going to make it in your church building. And that's okay, because we're not called to put people inside this building. We're called to flood heaven with the people on earth. And so... And so our mission ground, our focus is not trying to get people in here. Our focus and our mission field is Los Angeles, to reach the loss of the city of Los Angeles, to have a heart for the broken, to have a heart for the homeless, to have, have a heart for, for, for the, the gang violence, to have a heart for, for kids that are in abusive homes, to have a heart for broken neighborhoods and, and, and women, single mothers that don't know what to do. They don't know how to raise their four or five kids. They don't know how to get through. We are here for them. We are here for them. And I want you to come into agreement in prayer and ask God, God, how can we infiltrate the city? That's what I'm praying. God, you, okay, you, you've given us Los Angeles. You've shown us Los Angeles. How can we partner up with other churches? Because it's not about us trying to do it by ourselves. Right, right, right. <laughs> how, can we, how can we partner up with other leaders, other people of God, organizations? How can we partner up with the city and lead the city as a body of Christ to reach Los Angeles, to, to rebuke this spirit of competition that, that, that has gotten in the way of people's souls. <laughs> I had a pastor call me, call me one time and he said, you better not steal my sheep. I said, huh? Steal your sheep? He said, hater. <laughs> like, first of all, those are not your sheep. That's Jesus' sheep. Like, I don't own the people. You don't own the people. God owns the people. We are his. You know what I'm saying? And so God is breaking down walls, and we want to be on the forefront of this. We want to be on the forefront of this to say, come on now, let's, let's do this together and let's reach this city. Because let me tell you, Hollywood is the Mecca for the world. Like, everything comes through Hollywood, through movies, through TV shows, through cinema, you know, through the music industry. Like, everything is happening in Los Angeles. If we can infiltrate Los Angeles, the world will be touched. Whew, that was not on here. This is on the Lord. So, God, have your way. Have your way. Thank you, Lord. Whew. Can you guys stand up? You, um, Isaac and Aaron, you guys stand up. God has such a call in your lives, in your generation, the age that you are right now, that God is, is going to be putting things in your heart. He's giving you a heart to reach people. And I want you to be prepared. It doesn't matter how old you are. God started speaking to me at a very young age, and God is speaking to you now. Can I just pray for you real quick? Can you guys just extend your hands like this? Just to, You can close your eyes, just focus on God. Father, I just speak over Aaron. I speak over Isaac. Lord, I thank you in the name of Jesus for their call. You just highlighted them to me because there's something special about them. I pray that they would remember this moment for the rest of their lives. I pray for a seed to, to grow on the inside of them, that you called them out, that you highlight, highlighted them. Even if they felt like they were hidden, even if they felt like they weren't good enough, even if they felt like they're unworthy because of things in their life, even if they felt like they were a certain way because of what their friends said or what people said or what they've experienced at school or whatever, Lord, I I thank you for breaking all of that around them right now in the name of Jesus, that they would know that they are called, that they are know that they are chosen, that they would know that you love them, that they would know that you are their, da that you are their daddy, that you are always going to be with them, that you'll never leave them or forsake them, no matter where they're at, no matter what darkness they're in, no matter what valley they're in, that you're going to be there with them. 
In Jesus' mighty name. Let them never forget this moment. In Jesus' mighty name. You guys are called. You guys are called. You guys are chosen. Okay? You're called. He's calling you. Remember this. All right. They're my, they're my cousins, by the way. So. <laughs> but God was like, he highlighted them. You know, Bob Jones was a, a, a prominent prophet. Anybody heard of Bob Jones? Some of you guys heard of Bob Jones. Bob Jones was like one of the most accurate prophets our previous generation had ever seen. I mean, he had some crazy prophecies. He saw things. I mean, he's, he had a prophecy back. I don't, I'm probably going to butcher this, but this is probably like in the 70s. And he said one day people are going to walk around with, with mini TVs. And what he saw was, was phones. He saw phones. God was just showing him all type of things, and he's, he, he was such a blessing to the body of Christ. And, uh, I mean, 2014, he passed away. But before he passed away, he gave a word. And he said, I see God is showing me that there's going to be a sign that when the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl, it's going to be the beginning of an end-time harvest. When the Kansas City Chiefs, he said, be on the lookout for the Kansas City Chiefs. And he, and he, and he kept saying this in 2014. And he said, I see the beginning of something happening in the world around the year 2020. Well, he passed away in 2014, and the Kansas City Chiefs win the Super Bowl in 2020. I mean, this, this, is, this, is, this is what he did. This is, this is how he moved in God. And so he's had many other prophecies. Look him up when you get a chance. Watch him on YouTube. I mean, he's been to heaven so many times. But one particular time... Um, is unforgettable. He, he, he actually died temporarily in 1975, and he's in heaven, and all this, well, he's not in heaven yet, but, but he's in the part before you get to heaven, <laughs> and he's in this line. He said that he just wakes up, and he's in a line. He, all his senses were stronger than ever. He can hear, he can smell, he can feel. He said it was stronger than ever. All his senses were very alert. He was, it, it, was, it, was, it was very, 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 very real, but he was in this line, and he said he saw Jesus at the head of the line, and everybody would just come up one by one, and Jesus would ask a question. And it was very interesting, the question that Jesus would pose. Jesus didn't ask, uh, are, are you a church member? <laughs> what church do you go to? <laughs> How many hours a day do you pray? Three? Two? Five minutes? What he asked was, he would look them in the eye one by one and say, did you learn to love? Did you learn to love? One by one, Jesus will look people in the eye and say, did you learn to love? Today's message is called love language. You know, what if at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you know, there's one mission, there's one goal, there's one assignment, there's, there's one thing that God has called us to do, there's one responsibility that surpasses us building our name, building our businesses, building our wealth and careers, which is all cool, but what if there's one thing that surpasses all of that? Like, what if there's one key to the reason why we are existing today on earth? What if there is one purpose for the reason why you and I have been created? The most popular question humanity asks all the time is, why am I here? What is my purpose? Because after all the money and the material things and the relationships, it gets, at the end of the day, there's still something missing. Why am I here? What is the point of all of this? And what if I was to say that our purpose is simply to love Jesus by loving people? Although God has called us to prosper with our marriages and prosper with our families and prosper with our kids and prosper, you know, with our careers and, you know, getting accomplishments, the Lord desires that we have accomplishments. The Lord desires that we get accolades. The Lord, the Lord desires that we do things great on the earth. But, but the point, like, what is the point of all this? What if the point for all these things that happen in our life, like the point of it was to learn how to love? Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and you're talking to them, you're sharing your heart, you know, it's good, like you got something really burning like in your heart, right? And you're like just spilling it out. You're talking to them and the person you're talking to is like nodding their head. They're like, like they're listening, right? They're engaged. And then they respond to you and you realize they missed the entire point. Has that ever happened to you? He said, that's his wife. You know, the most horrifying thing is if we 
live our lives, and one day stand before Jesus. And we realized in the moment we lived our lives and we missed the entire point of what he was trying to say to us. You know, when I first got married, I didn't understand. Like, I, 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 you know, I was loving my wife. We, we just got married and um, moved in. We got our first place. We're very excited. And I was just completely just like thrown off guard. You don't know I'm going to say this. But I was completely just taken off guard when she would come up to me and say, I feel like you don't love me. And I'd be like, huh? I say I love you every day. <laughs> what do you mean? I hug you, I kiss you, I tell you I love you every day. And she would always say, I just feel like you don't love me. I feel unloved. And I was so confused. I'm like, what, in, what do I need to do? And then I learned about love languages. And I discovered that my love language is words of affirmation. Like, I'd say, I love you, you know, I love you, I love you, I love you, because that's how I feel loved is when, you know, people say I love you to me. So I thought it was like that for everybody. But then I discovered that her love language was acts of service. She didn't want me just to say I love you. She wanted me to show her that I loved her. She wanted me to do and so I realized that I'm just saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, and she doesn't feel loved. And so God was like, all right, well, you need to start serving her. You need to start helping to clean up around the house. And I noticed that when I would do these things, all of a sudden, it was like I accessed her heart. What if we, what if we are missing the love language of God? What if the church all these years have missed the love language of God? Why so many people are turned off from church, why so many people are turned off from God, why so many people are turned off from the term Christian, what, what if we missed it? What if we missed it? <laughs> you know, John 3, 16 says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. From the very beginning, God sent Jesus because he loved the world. You know who the world is? The world is people. People, people, people. From the, this is all started because of people. Jesus came down because of people. Jesus died on the cross because you're, for your neighbors. He died for your family. He died for the people you can't stand. He died for the people that get on your nerves. He died for the people that you work with, the most annoying, aggravating people you can imagine, the people that you're holding unforgiveness towards. He died for them. He came for people. This entire situation of earth and redemption is centered around people. And we think we can just be alone and just be, be cut off from folks and not walk in love and, and, and do all these spiritual things and to stand before God one day. He's like, you missed the point. You missed the point. Why would I do all what I did and come down and die and live a, a life of 33 years in a human body and go through all this stuff for people and not create and call you to love people? We think God is looking for what we did. The, 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 scary, the scary thing is, is what if we stand before God one day and we, we, we have all these expectations that God is going to give us a clap because of, the, because of our performance. And instead, he's looking at us and judging us on how we loved. Love languages. Love language. Did you, did you, did you learn to love? This is Matthew 25, 31. Let me show you today, this, this message, I'm telling you, and we're going to keep continuing with this because this needs to be heard by us. I was so convicted. I repented probably 20 times during this time. When God was showing me stuff, I was like, God, I'm so sorry. I forgive people. Like, I was like, this was a purging for me. This is about to, I'm telling you, this is so powerful, but this is the truth because I don't want to stand before God one day. My father is just stood before God. And you know what? I know that, that he is so in joy and so in peace and having a time of his life. Because he loved Jesus by loving people. He loved people. He loved people. Listen, we show God, get this today, we show God we love him, not by how much time we're doing all this other stuff. We show God we love him by loving people. I'll prove it. Some of y'all don't believe me. I feel that religious spirit like, Matthew 25, 31, it says, so when the Son of Man comes in his glory, 
This is this is prophetic. This is this is this is this is going to take place one day. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. I don't want to get into who the goats are, but it's not great. <laughs> Let's just say you want to be a sheep. All right. So anyways, after, uh, after this separation, uh, it says in verse 34, it says, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom for you from the foundation of the world. Did you know that God has something incredible for us? Incredible, incredible, incredible for us. Oof. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. This is Jesus. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I, I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I, I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then people are going to be so confused. Like, what is he talking about? You were never in prison. When did you? We visited you in prison. What, what are you talking about? You were sick. Jesus was, first of all, Jesus is perfect. He's 100% God and he was 100% man. He, he, he was perfect. Sickness, he, he walked over sickness. He casted out sickness. He was never sick. What are you, I'm confused, Jesus. When were you sick? You were never in the hospital. What are you talking about? And people are going to get this revelation right then and there. And I would, I'd rather get the revelation now. <laughs> I don't know about you. I, I want to, yes, now. I want to get it now. It says, then the righteous will answer him in verse 37, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in and naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick and in prison and come to you? In verse 40, here is the revelation of the day, of the year. 2021. It says, and the king will answer and say to them, Assure us, surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to the least of these people, you actually were doing it to me. You know, I remember in elementary school, anybody remember elementary school? I remember in elementary school, listen, man, I went to a school, we, we had a bunch of comedians. You know, you could clown somebody's shoes, we'd be cracking, ah! You know, um, I remember one time I came to elementary school, my mom, we'll never forget this story, this story still torments me to this day. I was with my mom one day, I was walking around the mall, and it got to a point I was so tired, she keeps going to store after store after store. I got to a point where I stopped looking at, at, the, at the store name. I, I just would walk in the store with her and we'd be in the store. One, one time I was just following her along. I'm like, when can we go? And we entered into the store and I'm just walking around. It's like a shoe store. And I'm like, I felt like I discovered a gold mine, y'all. I looked and there was these shoes that looked like Jordans. I said, oh my goodness. And I looked at the price, it was $15. I said, oh my God. I'm not telling nobody at school. I'm about to come with, I'm, I'm, I'm about to be the man at school every single day for the rest of the year. I'm not telling nobody. Where am I? Let me keep this a secret. I know my mom's going to say yes to this. If I can get these shoes, she's not going to say yes to a, hundred, you know, a pair of shoes that cost $100. But she's going to say yes to some shoes, some Jordans that are $15. I made my case. I came to her. I said, Mom, I got to get these shoes. I'm going to be the man. They're only $15. And they're Jordans. She was like, oh, okay. Oh, well, all right, fine. Let's get them. Well, things happen so fast, and sometimes you're not really observant with certain things. Let's just say I went to school the next day. I was in fourth grade, and it started before school started. It was a long day. This kid came up to me and said, yo, Keith Allen, what? What in the world? And the other kids started coming across, looking at my shoe. I'm like, yeah, I'm 15, like, you know, like, I got, you know. And he said, why is Jordan doing a finger roll? <laughs> he said, isn't Jordan supposed to be dunking? Why is he doing a finger roll? I said, it was almost like my world came a lot, like, like my horizon just said, expanded in this revelation of the universe. I was like, Jordan is doing a finger roll. And it don't even say Jordan, it's like Horden. I'm like, what in the, 
I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so I'm walking, I'm, I'm like, it's like lunchtime. Kids are like, hey. <laughs> Look, that was the longest day of my life. I came back, I threw them shoes down. I was like. <laughs> and I realized that we went to Payless. I thought, I thought it was Foot Locker. I, I didn't. But anyways, look, you can clown somebody's shoes and get away with it. You know what I'm saying? It's funny. Like, I was laughing. It was, it was all fun. It was funny. You know, they never saw me in that again. But, you know, you can clown somebody's shoes. <laughs> you can clown somebody's haircut. You know what I mean? But let me tell you this. You could never talk about somebody's mama. You could cross the line with everything else. But if you say something about my mama, it's a wrap. It was like fighting words. Like, I saw fights literally break out in school. You said something about somebody's mom. It was, it, was, it was about to go down because we loved our moms so much that if you said something about them, you were really saying something about us. Have you ever loved somebody so much or been down with them? Maybe one of your boys or, or girls or, you know, you, you, you're down with them and someone has said something negative about them or done something negative to them. Has that ever made you feel like they were really doing that to you? Do you know Jesus loves you and I so much? He loves people so much. He loves the people that get on your nerves. He loves the people that are prideful, that you bump heads with. He, he loves the people who are arrogant. He, he loves the people that are racist. He loves the people that think they know it all. He loves the people that use you. He loves the people that talk behind your back. We don't understand that love, but he loves them. And when you say something that is negative against them and do something negative against them, you're not really doing it against them. You're doing it against Jesus. You're not really rude to them. You're being rude to Jesus. You're not just offended and holding on unforgiveness against them. You're offended and holding on forgiveness against Jesus. Because Jesus loves them so much. He loves them more than you can ever hope, think, or imagine. Because he created them in his image and likeness. And although they get on our nerves, that, that, those are his babies. And he said, whatever you do to them, you're doing actually to me. And unfortunately, one day, like I said, people are going to stand before God and not understand God's love language. And they're going to realize that God's love language was actually us loving him by loving people. His love language is for you to love people. Amen? It says in Matthew 7, 21, this is what it says. I want to show you this. I've looked at this before. <laughs> But, you know, as you grow, God begins to take layers off, and he begins to go deeper with stuff to expose things. It says in Matthew 7, 21, this is what it says. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will, the will, the will, the will of my Father in heaven. You can call me Jesus. You could call me Lord, but, but it's not about that. It's those who do my will what I created you to do, how I created you to be my will. For God so loved the world. The world is made up of a lot of different people. For God so loved the criminals. For God so loved the prostitutes. So, for God so loved the pimps. For God so loved the, the, the homeless people. For God so loved the people walking down the street talking to themselves. For God so loved the haters, for God so loved the racists, the bigots, for God so loved Donald Trump. Uh-oh. For God, no, seriously, for God so loved the world, everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus is the first Adam. If Jesus is a son, we are a son too. So put yourself in that same scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave Keith Allen. 
to, to, to be an example, to love people. For God so loved the world, put your name in it. That is the mission. That is the assignment. That is what God is calling you to do and be. That is the love language, and that is the point. That is it. For God so loved the world that he gave, he gave, he gave, he gave, he gave his only begotten son. He gave his children. Jesus redeemed us so that we, we could be sons and daughters. Jesus went to the cross and he took your place so we could be, the, be sons and be daughters. And Jesus said, what I have done, now you're going to take it to the next level. Because he said, I am one person, and Jesus was loving people and healing people and, and comforting those people. He was picking up women that were caught in adultery, and, and everyone was trying to stone her, and, and he would cover her. He, he was out there as the protector, but, but Jesus said, I have good news. It's just one of me, but there's millions of you. And when I go to the cross, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit, who, who is the third person of me, is going to live on the inside of you. And when the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of you, you have to continue what I did. Jesus, what we are is a continuation of the process that Jesus was doing on earth. We look at Jesus, we're like, oh, that was cool. He loved people. I'm a Christian. Look, look, at, look at what Jesus was doing. I know that story. I know that story. No, listen, you're supposed to create a new story. I, I don't know. We're supposed to create a new story. We're supposed to create a new story in Los Angeles that his book will continue in heaven, that testimonies are still being lived out. Do you know this, that Bob Jones was in heaven and he was having conversations with different people and the Lord told him that, that the testimonies of the people who are written in the Bible, their testimonies are not fulfilled yet, that they're still continuing through us. Their testimonies, the people that you read about in here, they're still inspiring and moving other people to do, to copy them as they copied God. Their testimonies are still not over yet. He wanted to talk to, all, to, to the disciples. He wanted to meet all these people. And Jesus was like, no, 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 their testimonies is, is still happening. It's still happening. We, we're not over yet. We, we, this isn't done. We are continuing the process of what Jesus did and the others that have come before us. It says, now, who, now everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall, shall not enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? These, I mean, that, that's, these are super Christians. Have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, this is Jesus, in the line, I never knew you. I've seen it so many times, and I asked the Lord a question. I said, Lord, this doesn't make sense. How did you not know them? For you to operate in this level of faith, for you to pray for people and see demons come out, for you to see miracles happen, for you to lay your hands on the sick and see them recover, for you to lay hands on someone and to get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and for you to move at this level and authority in the spiritual realm, how, do you, how are you not connected to Jesus? You mean to tell me I can do all these different things and still be off? And I said, how, Lord? How? When you say you never knew them, isn't that a little extreme? Like you never knew them? I mean, obviously, they accepted you the first time, right? And the whole process started. What do you mean you never knew them? <laughs> then this is what God showed me. I'm going to read this again. This is Matthew 25, 37. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? When do we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did, we, when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Oh, surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. When we love people, we are loving Jesus. When we forgive people, we are forgiving Jesus. And Jesus is basically saying, I never knew you. But what he is saying is, he's not saying, I never knew you. He's saying, the people that I've called you to love never knew you. And because they never knew you, neither do I. The people that I've called you to love have never met you. They have never received your love. You thought you were doing me a favor by loving them. No, you are loving me. 
You thought you were, oh, I'm serving the, serving the sick, and I'm serving the poor, and I'm, I'm help volunteering. No, you are serving Jesus. God loves them, and, and, and he loves them as his own. And when you're doing it for them, you're doing it for him. You're doing it to him. This is what it says in 1 John 4, 20. If someone says, I love God, and I've said this before, I love Jesus. I love God, but he hates his brother. He's a liar. Dang. For he who does not love his brother, whom he sees all the time, how in the world is he going to love God, whom he's never seen? We have it twisted. And I pray that this message gets repeated throughout the world. There's two different types of love because I need to break it down because many people are like, I, I love people. I love people. I, 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 okay. And I said that too before I, before I, God was showing me this. There's two different types of love. There's a worldly love and there is a kingdom love. Everyone say worldly love. You know, worldly love is what is inundated in our culture. Worldly love is the love that we were raised in. Many of us, we love Jesus, but we love Jesus with a worldly love. We love Jesus with a worldly love. We are ignorant to the kingdom love because we've been just exposed to the worldly love. That's, that's, that's all we know. And that's why I said earlier that church has been labeled as a place of judgment. And that's why the term Christian is a term that turns off so many people. Because when people met someone with the title of a Christian, they were met with worldly love. And unfortunately, now we have this bad rap that this is the love that we operate in. And not only that, now it's gone a step deeper and now people don't even want to know God because they think he's like us. Let me break it down even more. Worldly love is loving people depending on how you feel. If they love me, then I love them back. If they don't love me, I'm not loving them back. This is how we were raised. This is what we know. This is our culture. If they reject me, well, forget you. I would say something else, but I know the religious antennas will be like, eee! but you know what I would really say. You know what I'm saying? We love people based on conditions, based on how we feel. You know, it, it changes all the time. Worldly love changes all the time because you're in a different mood every day. Right? You, you change all the time. That, that, that's worldly love. Worldly love is, is centered in pride and it envies what other people have. Worldly love causes us to manipulate and control people so that they can fulfill our needs. Worldly love only loves someone because of what they can do for them. Not because truly of who they are. Yes, I know everybody at work loves you, but the moment you let them down, it's another story. Worldly love. That's worldly love. But I want to talk about a love that the world does not know about, that I need our church to know and operate in and move in to be an example to the rest of the body of Christ, to be an example to your family, to be an example to the, to, 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 to the city, to be an example to people who know you. And this is the love that I need you today to start saying, God, show me this love. Give me wisdom about this love. Show me how to walk in this love. Give me power how to walk in this love. What is this love? I don't know. I've only, I only know worldly love. I follow you, but I operate in worldly love. That's why nobody wants to know you through me. I said, that's the reason why people don't want to know you through me. It's because I only know worldly love. I just went off on them yesterday. I just went off on them yesterday. Like, God, show me this love. This is not a love that requires you to walk in perfection, no. But this is a love that requires you to walk in humility. I blew it earlier this week with a friend of mine. And when I blew it, I, I made sure to call him back and apologize and say, man, I blew it. I blew it. I'm sorry. I, had, I, I, I was definitely in pride. I blew it. You see, that's, that's, that's kingdom love. That's the other type of love. This is the love of Jesus, kingdom love. And I want to show you this. This is Luke 27 because this is going to be unheard of, but I need you to just get this in your spirit and watch this again if you have to. Luke 6, 27. Jesus wants to teach 
the love of God. What is the love of God? Because people don't know this love. They just know worldly love. But I say to you here, love your enemies. What? Love your enemies? Love people, love your enemies? <laughs> What's, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. Wait a minute, I know they're using me. I know they're taking advantage of me. You want me to pray for them? You want me to pray for them? Not cuss them out, beat them up, talk about them. You want me to pray for them? Not expose them to every, everyone else on Facebook and expose them on Instagram and look at these people over here. You, let me expose this church. Let me expose this leader. You, 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 want, me to, you want me to pray for them? Luke 6.32, this is what he says. He's going to talk about worldly love because he says, he says, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? That's worldly love. Anybody can do that. I can be cool with anybody who's cool with me, but God had to put me through the test, and I had to learn how to love people that didn't like me, and I had to learn how to love people that were cold and, and heavy-hearted. And I would be consistent with them. I remember we were going to a halfway house. I don't even know how many years ago now. Five years ago, probably now. We were going to a halfway house, and these dudes just got out of prison. And there was one dude. I was going. I was DJing. I was the DJ there. And we would minister to them. We would play music. We would feed them. It was great. It was every single Friday. And this one guy, he was a skinhead. And this dude had SWAT stickers, like, on his face, on his arms. Like, you know, he, 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 was, he, he, he looked kind of scary, okay? <laughs> I'm a grown man. I'm just being honest. The brother looked intimidating, okay? I'm, I'm going to be humble and just say that, all right? He looked crazy, okay? Um, so I was stepping out of my comfort zone. <laughs> and the Lord said, when I saw him, he was just like, he was sitting in the back. The Lord said, go over there and talk to him. I said, I rebuke that. That is not God. That's the devil. The Lord was like, no, you know who it is. All right. So I remember going up to him the first week, and I said, hey, man, how you doing? Keith Allen, man, hey, we're going to have a good time today, man. I hope, hope you're ready for that. He was like, the next week I saw him, God said, do it again. So I came up to him the next week, and he was still, you know, and I said, hey, what's up, man? How you doing? I was like, man, it's good, good to see you again, man. Good to see you. He was like, this time it was a little different because he gave me like a little, it was like a little something. I was like, okay, okay. Progress. <laughs> I came back the third week, and I saw him there, and he was a little bit more loose. He was a little more loose. He was just like, I could just see something kind of shifted. And I went up to him. I said, yo, I forgot his name, but I said his name. Said, My man, how you doing, man? Look at you, man. Look good, man. We're about to have a good time today, man. You ready? Are you ready for the food? I heard it's great. And he was like, yeah, man, I, I, I am, you know. And he was talking now. And I'm like, oh, my God, I saw his teeth. Like, it was something new. I was like, oh, okay. Let me not mess this up. Let me go. Okay. <laughs> Man, within a couple of months, I promise y'all, I would come in, King, what's up? Hugs, boom. Yo, man, come on. Hey, partying with him. Because the love of God is impossible to stop. The love of God is the most powerful force in the universe. It is the most powerful force in the universe. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can stop it. Nothing can get in the way of the love of Jesus. There are stories of people that have been in third world countries that have been put in prison because of their faith, and the people who are tormenting them and oppressing them will be tormenting them and oppressing them while they're in prison, and they will just begin to love them and begin to honor them and begin to say, do you need any prayer for anything? While they haven't eaten and they're frail and they've been beat up, they're asking the guards, do you need prayer for anything? And it's been said time and time again that these same people have won people to Jesus. Next thing you know, the people who are guards are in, are in the prison with them now. 
because the love of Jesus is impossible to stop. And this is a power that it's time for you and I to step into, to walk into. Enough of worldly love and walking in carnality, walking in pride, walking in selfishness, being entitled, oh, it's their fault, oh, they don't deserve this, they don't deserve that. It is time to step into your kingdom position as a son and as a true daughter in God. This is what it says. Verse 34, it says, And if you lend to those from from who you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? If you lend to those and you and you expect to receive back, you know, there's people that God is telling you to serve and and, and God will call you to sow somewhere. You know, I want to say this real quick, man. We've been married eight years. I can't tell you how many people God has put on our hearts to bless over the eight years. There's sometimes where God would be like, there was a season in my life, we had $1,000 in the bank, and there was a family of four or five, they got like five now, and car broke down, they were past doing the rent, uh, I mean, they couldn't do it. We had $1,000 left in our account. The Lord said, give them $1,000. <laughs> I was like, oh God, I'm going to see what Maral says. <laughs> the Lord told us to give all the money we have. She was like, Okay. Are you sure this is God? Anyways, long story short, we end up doing it. We end up doing it, right? We end up doing it. And the crazy thing about it is the same week, I think we booked, like, we had a DJ company, the biggest party that we booked that year. And the girl pulled up to our house with cash deposit. I mean, God literally gave us double back in the same week. It was powerful. But I will say this, and I, and I, and I need to go here. There's people that we have given to, such as them, and, you know, maybe things between us didn't work out. Maybe someone got offended. Maybe something happened. And everything in me wanted to be like, yo, after I just gave you, after all that I've done for, you're going to treat me like, but God said you didn't do it to them. You did it to me. You don't need to bring back what you did. Learn this right now. When God tells you to give anything to anybody, know that God got you. God has you. You don't need to be offended with them because they still treat you the same way or they have it. No, no, no. The expectation is, is that I'm obedient to Jesus. As I'm loving you, I'm loving him. And he says, everything that you give shall be given back to you. <laughs> Press down. My Uncle Robert's here. Come on. Uncle Pastor Robert. Uncle Pastor Robert. Here we go. Press down, shaking together, and running over. Woo! You got to worry about nothing. I want to say that because I'm tired of the pride, man. I want to break it off of our church, break it off of us. I, I don't, I, we have to walk and live like Jesus. He's not calling us to live in perfection. We ain't never going to be perfect. I got issues. I make mistakes every single day. I apologize to my wife at least once a day, okay? <laughs> I, I do. But at the end of the day, I come back and say, God, I'm here. Use me. If I need to repent, I repent. If I need to ask somebody for forgiveness, I do it. If I blow it, I get back up. Because it's not, it's not about performance. It's about making Jesus the Lord of your heart. Amen. I want to end this because I want to show you how to tap into this kingdom love. This love that is supernatural. Many of us don't know this love, even though we've been coming to church The reason why we're not sold out, the reason why we're holding back things in our lives is because we still don't know this love. We've tapped around it. We know God is is good, but we haven't truly stepped into the love, the love, the love of Jesus, into kingdom, kingdom love, because the love of Jesus melts your heart. You can't be offended no more. You want to be offended, and you can't. Because the love of Jesus just melts your heart. You're like, God, I just, I just want to love people. The God, and, and I want to show us how we can tap into this this year and move in such a warm, powerful love that operates where people say, there is something about you. What do you do? Where are you going? What's going on? It says, Luke 19, it says, then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Everyone say Jericho. Jericho. We all got our own Jericho. <laughs> Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. 
tax collector. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, but he was a chief tax collector. And 2,000 years ago in the Middle East, you did not want to be a tax collector because tax collectors were disliked. They were at the bottom of the bottom. Yeah, they had money, but they had no friends. The Jewish people looked at these tax collectors as traitors because these tax collectors were Jewish, but, the, but these tax collectors were teaming up with the Romans, and the Romans were oppressing the Jews. So if a Jewish person saw a tax collector, they would look at them crazy, say something to them, throw something at them. Like, they did not like these tax collectors because these tax collectors, man, they were greedy. They were, they, they, they were crooks. They would take advantage of people, and people had no defense. They couldn't even fight back. And so Zacchaeus is the chief of them. He's the worst of the worst. He probably feels like he is the unlikeliest person to ever be received by Jesus. And there's people who are here right now, and there are people who are watching right now. You probably feel like the unlikeliest candidate to be received by Jesus because you look at your life and you see the mess and you see the dirt and you see the addictions and you see the secrets and you see the mistakes and you see your anger and you see your lust and you see your mind and you see every perversion. You see these different things that people don't even know about is going on inside of you, but you see it there. And because of that, you feel like it's very unlikely to be fully received by Jesus. And although Zacchaeus had heard of Jesus, Jesus was always at a distance because if he came too close, he would see the mess that I have and reject me. And many of us have been keeping him away. But all of a sudden, Zacchaeus hears that Jesus is passing by. He hears it. And all of a sudden, he gets this hunger to go after him. In verse 3, it says that, and he sought to see who Jesus was. But he couldn't because there was a lot of people. There was a crowd. And he was short of stature. He was trying to see Jesus. He was trying to experience Jesus. He was trying to get to know Jesus on a whole nother level, but there was a crowd in his way that was blocking him. He couldn't see. He, was, he couldn't see over people's heads. And God showed me that there's crowds in your life right now that are blocking you to see the fullness of Jesus. <laughs> crowds represent distraction and noise. There's crowds in your way. Jesus is passing by, but, but there's so many crowds in your life. There's crowds of toxic relationships that just take from you. There's relationships that you love to hang out with. Yeah, they make you laugh, but they take you further away from Jesus every time. There's relationships that remind you of the old you when Jesus is trying to take you to the new you. There's crowds of depression and crowds of sadness, and there's crowds of perversion and lust. There's crowds of Netflix. There's crowds of laziness. There's, there's crowds of being complacent around you in your life, and Jesus is passing by. And so what he does is he decides to say, I got to break free from this crowd. I got to see who Jesus is. I need my breakthrough. So he begins to run, and he runs, and he runs, and he runs to beat the crowd. The boy has some wheels. <laughs> boy, he was, a, he was a track star back in the day. He was running. Um, I don't know why I just did that. But anyways, he runs, and he climbs up on the tree to get a better view at Jesus. And I want to show you this because this is so powerful. I've never seen this before. It says, verse 4, he ran ahead and he climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass by. And it says in verse 5, and when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down today, for today I must stay at your house. This is a very big town. There's lots of people. Jesus comes directly where Zacchaeus is in the tree and calls his name. How do you know his name, Jesus? Zacchaeus is the shortest person in the crowd. Zacchaeus is in the crowd that is blocking him, the crowd of all of our issues and stuff. And so he feels like in order for Jesus to really see me, I got to work harder. In order for Jesus to see me, I have to stop doing this. Because that's your crowd. In order to get Jesus' attention, I must stop doing that. But do you know Zacchaeus didn't have to run after all? Oh, I'm about to break this down. Zacchaeus didn't have to run at all. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus could have stayed where he was. He could have sat down on the ground, on the ground in his issues, in his mess, in his dirt. Because the entire time, the reason why Jesus was coming into Jericho was to see Zacchaeus. You think you got to change up all of this stuff. And the entire time, Jesus is coming after you. 
Even in your addiction, even if you don't quit this, even if you don't stop smoking, even if you don't stop drinking, even if you don't stop looking at porn, even if you don't stop, Jesus is saying, I'm coming straight to you. And I know, and I, because we, we're trying to stop the, we're trying to do the behavior modification, and, and, and this is what's been stopping Zacchaeus from coming to Jesus, because he has all these issues. And let me tell you what happens. Jesus comes to Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, first of all, he knows his name. He knows his name. I want to let you know, I don't know where you've been or what's going on. Jesus knows everything about you. He knows your name. And when he calls him his name, it's a name of empowerment that he encourages him. I know you. I know you. I want you to know that he knows you, that he sees you in your mess. He sees you in the situation, the drama. He sees the stress. He sees the fears. He sees you. He sees you. He wanted Zacchaeus to know, I see you. I see you. And Zacchaeus, you didn't have to climb up in a tree. You, you could have stayed where you were. Many of us think we need to find Jesus over here. And Jesus is like, I'll find you right here. I'm going to say it again. Many of us think we have to work and hard and try. And I got, in order for me to, to be used by God, I got, I got to stop. I got to listen. All you have to do is be where you are and receive him. Let me tell you why. This is what happens. For those of you that don't believe me, for that religious spirit again, I'm, I'm uh, got to keep going. Got to keep going. So it says, he made haste and he came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, the people complained. You see, this is what we do as the church even what I'm saying, there's people listening like, mm, I don't know, he doesn't have to change anything. Like, what do you mean? What are you, what are you trying to say? Look at this. I'm talking to you. It's that worldly love because we don't get it because this is how we, this is all we know. We don't know. We just know performance. We were in school as kids and we, we got to, you know, do well to get an A or, or a B or a C. We get graded in life. We get graded at our jobs. We get graded, you know, with how many Instagram followers we have. Or we, we get graded. People are always judging us. We, we just live in a, a world of judgment. We, so we think God judges us the same way we judge the world. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord. No, wait, hold on. I'm sorry. So he made haste and he came down. Verse 6. And he received Jesus joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus is, he doesn't know a lot about God. He, he does, he's never been to church before. He, he, he's new. He, he doesn't know anything. He, he just has this encounter with the love of Jesus. He, he just has a, an encounter and acceptance with, with, with kingdom love. He doesn't know the right way to dress. He doesn't know the right way to speak. He still cusses every other word he talks. He doesn't know. He just had this encounter with Jesus, and he just receives him joyfully. And many people that are watching and are here today, God is saying, I just need you to receive me joyfully. Just receive me joyfully. Don't worry about how you're going to clean up and how you're going to do that. Just receive me joyfully. This is the powerful part. Then Zacchaeus stood and he said to the Lord, get this. This is the entire message is this part right here. I had to prepare you for this. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anybody... If I've stolen anything from anybody by false accusation, I'm going to give back fourfold. Here is the deal. When did Jesus tell Zacchaeus to give anything to anybody? Many of us are trying to give without first receiving his love. And that's why people leave the church. That's why people leave God. That's why people leave relationships. Because we are empty. Zacchaeus receives joyfully. He receives first. Then as he receives joyfully, on his own revelation, he says, I want to give to people. I want to give to the people that, that I robbed. Not only that... The people who Zacchaeus ripped off, do you think those people were nice to him after that? The people who Zacchaeus ripped off, do you think the people had some nice things to say about Zacchaeus? He was going to give back to people who hated him, 
people who cursed him, people who, 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 who wanted to beat him up, people that, that mocked him, people that, that wanted to kill him. He wanted, he wanted to give to people fourfold of, the, of what he took from them. He wanted to bless them and abundantly and abundantly, the people who didn't love him or like him or spit at him. He wants to bless people who are the haters, who are the worst people in your life. He wanted to bless his enemies. And Jesus never asked him to do anything. Why? Why does he have this encounter with kingdom love and all of a sudden, naturally, he wants to go and bless people? He wants to serve people. He wants to love people. Jesus never asked him of that. You know why? Because when you have an encounter, you can put this point up, when you have an encounter with kingdom love, when you, encounter, when you have an encounter with kingdom love, you begin to see Jesus in people. When you receive the love of Jesus, you begin to see Jesus in people. Jesus didn't have to say, when you do it to them, you're doing it to me. He didn't have to read the Bible and get the revelation. He just got a revelation of love. He doesn't know the Bible. He, he just knows this revelation of love, and he just wants to serve and love people. Many of us are going, trying to serve people without the revelation of love from Jesus. We're trying to do all these things instead of just receiving joyfully first. Then you're able to love people as Jesus loves people. And this is what Jesus says. Emma, can you come up? You guys can stand to your feet. Jesus says to them, Trace, I'm going to need you to sing too. You need to come back and sing on a Sunday. That's my Uncle Tracy. He, needed, he could sing. Yeah. God, just show me you right now. Can you extend your hands on him? Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the anointing and the call on my Uncle Tracy, who is one of my dad's best friends. And Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for this season. I thank you, Lord, for the calling that is on his life to, to move mountains, to move mountains that have been in the way, that there's such a gift, such an anointing, such a presence. And I thank you for tripling that in this season, that the anointing on his life is tripled, tripled, tripled. And I thank you for that same anointing and blessing to spill over on his kids, to spill, to spill over on his family, the same anointing, the triple blessing anointing on his life. In the name of Jesus, amen. So it says this. So Jesus says to Zacchaeus, he says to Zacchaeus, after Zacchaeus has a revelation to give and serve people, he says, today, salvation has come to this house because he's also a son of Abraham. He never repented. He never did the confession. He, he never did all the religious Western things we feel like we have to do to come to Jesus. He just received the love of Jesus and, and, and he was adopted right then and there. He was adopted right then and there. But the adoption wasn't even finite until he received and then he gave out of what he received. You see, God is calling you to receive, but he's also calling you to give. The point of life, the point of your purpose is to receive the love of God simply and, and, and reveal the love of God to others. That is the purpose of life and that is the fulfillment. Let me end with this one thing. He said, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to this house. Bob Jones was walking in heaven with Jesus and he was walking in heaven and he noticed these beautiful mansions beautiful mansions on top of hills. It was just beautiful. And from a distance, he saw this huge mansion. It was like a castle. And as he looked at this mansion, Jesus said, that belongs to a woman named Corey Tinboon. And he said, Corey Tinboon was a Dutch woman that lived during the days of the Holocaust. And Corey would hide Jewish people in her house. And one day, she got caught and they put her in a concentration camp. And he said, Bob, I want you to copy her humility. I want you to copy her love because she copied me. And Jesus went on to explain the mansions in heaven. He said, the mansion that you see didn't start being built when she got here. The mansion that you see built, I started building in her on earth. 
He said every single time you endure and you press through, every single time you persevere through the trials and tribulations, every single time you keep saying, Jesus, I serve you, every single time you love people who spit on you and you forgive those who spitefully use you, every single time you endure and walk as I walk, I begin to build this house. Not only on the inside of you, but your mansion in heaven is being built simultaneously. Every single time you love someone that doesn't deserve your love, your house is getting bigger. (laughs) Every single time that you serve and you love the people who I've called you to, you are establishing yourself not only in this life, but in the next life also. As you are growing in this world, I'm growing you in the next world. Because as it is in, as it is in heaven, it shall be on earth. What you are doing here speaks for eternity. I want to live in a nice house, a big old house. The houses are being built now. Every time you love people, you are loving Jesus. Let's pray real quick. Father, we right now repent in the name of Jesus. Everyone that we have just treated unfairly, Father. Everybody that we have backlashed. Every, everybody that we have talked about, dragged through the mud. Father, every relationship, Father, that has hurt us and, and we have this unforgiveness toward them. Everyone, Father, that, that we have just hated, Father, that we have disliked, that, that we have ignored purposely, that we have walked past people because they did something or we just don't like them. All these people, Father, I pray that you would show us right now. Show us the people right now that we've been offended with. Lord, show, put them on our hearts. Show us family members. Show us friends. Show us coworkers. Show us people, Lord God, that we have just walked, that we have have not treated the way you wanted them to be treated in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, I just impart right now kingdom love in your people in the name of Jesus, a love that cannot be broken, a love that cannot be uh, rejected, a love that is powerful in the name of Jesus. I speak this over your people in Jesus' name. Receive an impartation of of of, of the love of Jesus. And those of you who have not experienced this love, I want you to experience the love that I experience. And, and I just impart the, a love right now, Father, the love that you show me every day. Lord, I pray that right now the people who are here and those who are watching would receive this love right now in the name of Jesus. Just say, I receive it. Come on. I receive it. I receive it. No, you are his baby. I receive it. He loves you. He's not looking at your mess and disappointed. I receive you. In Jesus' name. And if you've never received Jesus, if you never said yes to Jesus, be like Zacchaeus right now and just say yes to Jesus. Just say yes. He just wants you to say yes. He doesn't want you to think about everything. Just say yes. Say yes. If you receive him today, that he took your place on the cross, that he died for all your sins, past, present, and future, and he just wants a relationship with you, just say yes. Say yes in the chat. Say yes on YouTube. Say yes in the comments. Say yes. Can we give him a shot of praise? Come on. 